This busy stretch along Southeast Powell and 57th is no place to call home. Piles of trash and unknown waste surround the tents and broken vehicles sprawled across a frontage road. This troubled space serves as a vivid example of the nearly 100 homeless encampments spread across the city. These growing tent communities are now part of the fabric of Portland. They surround us, and many neighbors have run out of patience. It's not just where the camps are, you know, that, that's being affected. I know that we happen to live right behind it, but it's, you know, our friends and neighbors that live several blocks away, you know, all the way over to, toward Foster, all the way over toward Division, they're affected too. To better understand the impact of an encampment, we zeroed in on Southeast Powell and 57th, where over the past two years, residents have filed more than a thousand complaints about illegal camping on the city's website. You got prostitution, drug selling, someone might get drunk. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty sad. Paul Woods, who lives a block and a half away from the encampment, said it's not unusual for trouble to spill into the you neighborhood, know, I, including petty crime like vandalism and heavy, theft. I got motion lights all around the place, I put heavy screens on the doors. It's really deflating. A few families have decided to sell their homes to get yeah. away from the encampment. It's, it's really hard. We love our neighbors and the neighborhood, and it's been, it's been tough. It was bittersweet for sure. Yeah, absolutely. After yes. 16 years in the Foster Powell neighborhood, <laughs> Keely Montgomery and her family are packing up and moving to Tigard. She's sympathetic to those living in the encampment, but after repeatedly finding hypodermic needles on the sidewalk, having bikes stolen, and all the stress, Montgomery has had enough. Our hope is that, you know, these people get help too, and it's not just, you know, it's not just about us, it's about them too. City and regional crews have cleaned up or completely removed the encampment almost two dozen times over the past two years, with a price tag totaling just over $18,000. Despite those repeated efforts, piles of trash, old food, and hazardous waste have again become part of the landscape. Last summer before was the worst. The Neighbors worry about the environmental impact. And, uh, how much garbage there was. Where do these people take care of their business? <laughs> In uh, my neighbor's bushes? And uh, where does all this trash end up? In our sewer drains? And there are concerns about fire. Over the past two years, emergency crews have responded to more than 10 reports of fire at the encampment. Additionally, there have been nearly a dozen complaints about abandoned cars or debris in the roadway blocking the right of way. Trimets had issues, and some nearby businesses say their customers just don't feel safe. I can't say that we're losing business, but people are more afraid to come to the office because they're more afraid uh, they see this chaos and they're like, why is this such a mess? Oh my goodness. Across the street on Southeast Powell, the classic denture center is open for business but the front door is locked. Right now, door always locked, and uh, I wouldn't open the door. I will go first look, um, yeah. Southeast Powell and 57th, which is controlled by the Oregon Department of Transportation, hasn't always looked this bad. Images from Google Maps in June 2019 show empty spaces. Yeah, 57 Powell, yeah. Two years later, it's become a well-established encampment with a portable toilet set up by the city. When we visited, eight unhoused people were staying at the encampment, including Aisha Martin. The 41-year-old worked for TriMet before falling on hard times. And it can happen to anyone. You know, never take life for granted. Martin, who's been homeless for almost two years, has spent the past two months sleeping in a tent at Southeast Powell and 57th. Why here of all places? What does it bring you to this specific location? Um, it's more open. I wouldn't want to be somewhere where it's secluded and if something happened, then nobody would know. Um, and also it's pretty small. It's only a few people here that I know pretty well. So and it's one of the cleanest camp sites that I know of. Eddie Lafferty and his girlfriend parked their van here almost six months ago. Kind of like home. <laughs> so I used to have a best friend that see it. I lived in that house right there when I was younger. The campsite attracts frequent visitors, like Ray Seamster, whose car is overloaded with stuff. 
my fridge is up right here, so that's why I come here a lot. Instead of shuffling people around from encampment to encampment, the 36-year-old says the real solution is housing. I mean, I've seen it happen several times. People get kicked out, get green tag or whatnot, and three days later, they're back, back here, you know what I'm saying? Same thing all over again, so. The city of Portland plans to start clearing more camps and to build six managed villages for people experiencing homelessness by the end of this year. In theory, the plan will move people into a safer space, away from neighborhoods and off the street like Southeast Powell and 57th. We aren't too old for this anymore. Because as it stands now, many homeless are simply being pushed from one spot to the next. There's no real solution. Campsites dot the map. And with every new or growing encampment, the social and economic impact is multiplied. The homeless crisis touches every corner of our community. Okay, let's talk to Kyle Boshi about this for just a second. Now, we know that there are encampments just like this all over town, but are they just like this? How similar are they uh, in the reports that are made and the type of impact they have on the community? Well, we certainly heard similar complaints across the entire city. More than 100,000 complaints from citizens about illegal campsites across the city of Portland. And those complaints have the same type of issues, trash, noise, petty crime, that type of thing. What we really want to try and illustrate here is this is just one example. These same type of problems are occurring at every encampment across the city and shuffling people around from one campsite to the next, it's just not a solution. How do neighbors react? I think most of the time we see the reaction between the neighbors and then the activists, but I imagine that the neighbor reaction gets a little bit more nuanced for the people and how they respond to these, these encampments. Right, most everybody, certainly they're sympathetic to those living in these encampments, but neighbors are somewhat divided. There are some who are fed up and say, listen, enough is enough, they've gotta be moved out of here. The other side of the camp, they say, listen, not so much. We need to help these. These are our neighbors and they're providing food, water, even dropping off furniture. And that creates some conflict as well because some neighbors say, listen, that's just not right. You're actually helping to fuel this, creating an even larger problem or a larger encampment. We need consistency in how we deal with these encampments. Got it. Kyle Boshi, thank you.